Hello and welcome to lecture number seven for U.S. history. Today we'll talk about the decade of the 1920s. Before I start the lecture, I'd like to address a few themes. Many historians have described the 1920s as a roaring decade for the nation, but not everyone participated in this prosperity. Many businesses experienced success and others had fun, but farmers struggled and we also see the reemergence of the Ku Klux Klan. A good place to begin a discussion of the 1920s is to explore some of the successes associated with American business interests during this decade. As the nation converted to a peacetime economy, there was a minor recession in the United States in the early 1920s. However, for the most part, during the decade, the United States experienced tremendous economic prosperity. We see that with this chart on the left, and we also see an increase in the gross national product from 70 billion in 1922 to about 100 billion in 1929. Increased profits for businesses were reflected in the stock market as the average price of stocks which were sold increased dramatically during the decade. The economy was heavily influenced by the purchasing power of consumers who bought a wide range of new products which were available for the first time. There were many new items, particularly electrical products, which transformed people's daily lives. For example, vacuum cleaners replaced brooms, items bought at supermarkets replaced home canned goods, and commercially baked bread replaced home baked bread. As this Christmas advertisement from the 1920s shows, there were a variety of new products people could purchase to impact their families. Items included vacuum cleaners, lamps, maybe even a fan, and a record player. There were so many new products it's difficult to go into detail on all of them, but I'd like to talk about two, the radio and the automobile. On the right, we see an advertisement for an RCA Victor radio. By 1930, about 14 million American families had a radio in their home. In 1926, the National Broadcasting Company, or NBC, was formed, and this was followed by the Columbia Broadcasting Company, CBS, the following year. These companies produced a variety of different programs, including the popular Amos and Andy, which became the first network comedy show in 1928. This was heard by families all over the country. Ford's modern assembly line brought the price of automobiles to a lower level by the late 1920s so that by 1930, 23 million registered cars were on the roads. Up to the mid-1920s, the Model T was the dominant car in the market. However, General Motors drove ahead by the latter half of the decade with its wide range of different models from which people could choose. The impact of the automobile was tremendous. It diminished the isolation of many people in rural areas, and it completely transformed dating patterns forever in the United States. If people didn't have enough money to purchase a brand new car, you could buy one that was used, or you could get credit, as seen in the advertisement on the right for the Ford Weekly Purchase Plan. By 1930, 60% of American families owned a car. This is a photograph from the early 1920s showing July 4th activities at a Massachusetts beach. Look at all of those Ford Model T's. They all look the same. Well, what was the cost or the impact of this consumer-oriented economy? Well, first of all, indebtedness increased dramatically. 
This chart shows the increase in consumer debt or consumer borrowing during the decade of the 1920s. In 1920, consumer debt was probably about two and a half billion dollars. By 1929, it was far too high at about eight billion dollars. This consumer-oriented economy also created a sense of sameness, maybe even conformity, as was shown in that photograph of all the Model T's at the beach in Massachusetts. People on the East Coast and the West Coast also listened to the same radio shows, which started at the same time, on the same days, and this added to that feeling of conformity. Furthermore, the environment was impacted at a much higher rate. We see an increased reliance on fossil fuels as gasoline production increased dramatically and large numbers of roads had to be constructed in order for those cars to drive more smoothly. So we see a wide range of impacts of this consumer economy. I'd like to continue the discussion of the Roaring Twenties by talking about the fun that people had and some popular heroes. There were many different popular heroes in the 1920s. I'll try to talk about a few. Interest in spectator sports increased dramatically in the 1920s as shown by Major League Baseball. Babe Ruth was a popular hero and he hit home runs like no one had before. In 1900, a young musician was born in New Orleans. He played the trumpet, and he was associated with a brand new form of music, and he was quite an innovator. The trumpeter was Louis Armstrong, and the music was jazz. People loved going to the movies in the 1920s, and as we see from this statistic here, by 1930, weekly movie attendance neared 80 million. The leading male actor of the decade was Rudolph Valentino, and he's shown here with a movie poster for the film, The Son of the Sheik. Well, in an era of heroes, the most celebrated hero was born in Detroit, Michigan, and grew up in Little Falls, Minnesota. His name was Charles Lindbergh. Lindbergh was interested in aviation from an early age, and he started off as a stunt flyer and an airmail pilot. He gained national attention in 1927 when he became the first man to fly alone from New York to Paris. He was important because he became a symbol for the United States. He combined his individual talents with brand new technology to accomplish something that no one had done before. Now we'll explore some of the changes facing women during the 1920s. There are a variety of things I'd like to mention dealing with women's roles. Politically, following the passage of the 19th Amendment, the women's movement splintered, so politically women weren't as active in the decade of the 1920s. However, women continued to work outside the home. The number of women who worked outside the home increased, however the percentage or proportion of women remained about the same at about 24 percent. However, even though women continued to work outside the home, they still earned less than their male counterparts in similar jobs. One thing that's interesting is that younger women were often portrayed in a brand new way. They were shown as flappers. A flapper, as shown here in this Life magazine cover from 1926, was usually a young woman with bobbed hair, a short skirt, and she may even have a cigarette hanging out of her mouth. The popular music for young people at the time was jazz music, and the dance craze that was spreading across the nation was the Charleston. Older individuals were upset that many casually broke the law by drinking alcohol during the era of prohibition, and many young people, including young women, openly discussed their sexuality.
this new popular image of the flapper, as well as openness about sex and the brand new jazz music, often associated with African Americans, contributed to a generation gap between parents and their children who were coming of age in the 1920s. I'd like to switch gears now and talk about politics during the 1920s. The political realm was dominated by the Republican Party throughout the entire decade of the 1920s as the Republicans controlled both the White House and Congress. The tendency was that they supported pro-business policies and took a hands-off approach to regulation. The president at the beginning of the decade was this man, Warren Harding. He was a former journalist turned senator from Ohio, known to enjoy poker parties as well as good liquor with his buddies, which were nicknamed the Ohio Gang. He wasn't a bad man, but unfortunately his administration is primarily remembered for the scandals which plagued him throughout his presidency. The first of the Harding administration scandals I'll mention involves Charles Forbes. He was the director of the Veterans Bureau. Eventually, he was convicted of stealing funds of the Veterans Bureau, the organization he was supposed to oversee. The second and the largest of these scandals involved Albert Fall, who was the Secretary of Interior. Fall allowed several oil companies to drill for oil on lands both in California and Teapot Dome, Wyoming. Eventually, he spent time in prison because he received what he called loans, but turned out to be bribes, in return for allowing the oil companies these favors. The nickname for the largest scandal was Teapot Dome because that was one of the locations where Albert Fall allowed this oil to be drilled. Harding was devastated by the actions of his so-called friends, and following a trip to Alaska, he died of a heart attack in 1923. Harding's vice president was Calvin Coolidge, and he took over the reins of the presidency following Harding's death. He wasn't associated with any of the Harding-era scandals, however, he did support many of Harding's policies, that of a high protective tariff, and he also promoted tax and spending cuts. In 1924, he won re-election in his own right. Next, I want to show how the decade of the 1920s wasn't roaring for everyone by talking about problems facing farmers, as well as the rise of nativism in the United States. Farmers faced a myriad of problems during the 1920s. While business in the nation prospered in the years following World War I, agriculture did not. Between 1919 and 1921, total farm income fell dramatically. Agricultural wages dropped. Farmers who had borrowed money during World War I couldn't repay their loans, and in some cases, they lost their farms. Many farmers looked to the government for help. After all, politicians going back to Andrew Jackson and Thomas Jefferson talked about farmers being the backbone of the nation. In the late 1920s, Congress acted, and they passed what came to be known as the McNary-Haugen Bill. Now, the McNary-Haugen Bill was a price support plan whereby the United States government would purchase surplus crops, crops like cotton, corn, rice, tobacco, wheat, and other commodities. Those excess products would then be sold on the world market. Instead of forcing farmers to rely on market prices themselves, the national government would step in and ensure that farmers got a fair price for their products. This passed in Congress in 1927 and 28, but was vetoed by President Coolidge both times.
Even though it didn't pass, this was still important because it demonstrated that the nation as a whole wasn't ready yet to subsidize agriculture. By the late 1920s, the problems facing farmers continued. However, by the 1930s, there would be a new president in the White House, and the government would be more responsive. I'll talk about that in the next lecture for this class. The final topic to be investigated will be the rise of nativism. We see a rise of nativism in the United States in the years following World War I, where Americans seem to be concerned about all things foreign. Now there could be a couple of explanations for this, maybe as a result of that World War I legacy of the super patriotism associated with the anti-German hysteria, Americans began to fear things that were not just German, but anything foreign. Also, there was a worldwide influenza epidemic that killed millions throughout the earth and about a half a million in the United States. This figure shows the death rate from influenza and pneumonia beginning in 1900 and extending to 1960. Notice how it peaked immediately after World War I. There are a few examples of actions which demonstrate this nativism. First of all, they deal with immigration laws and the reemergence of the Ku Klux Klan. In 1924, supporters of limited immigration to the United States successfully lobbied Congress to pass the National Origins Act. This established a strict quota system whereby the number of immigrants from certain nations would be limited. It particularly targeted immigrants from southern and eastern European nations. Immigration from Asian countries virtually ceased to exist. The 1920s also saw the re-emergence of the Ku Klux Klan. It's believed that membership could have been as high as 5 million individuals, and it was most popular in the Midwest, South, and Far West, including the states of Oklahoma, Oregon, and Indiana. The Klan was very visible, as we see with this parade down the streets of Washington, D.C. in 1926. Their motto in the 1920s was 100% Americanism, whatever that meant. And instead of being simply anti-black, it was not only anti-black, it was also anti-Jewish, anti-Catholic, and anti-foreigner. Support was quite strong until the mid to late 1920s, when several leaders became associated with violence and corruption. Even though support for the organization faded quickly, it demonstrated a darker side of the decade and the American character. Well, that was the core of this lecture today. I did want to end with some concluding comments. Well, today, as I talked about the decade of the 1920s, I tried to show that it was roaring for some, but not for everyone. Unfortunately for the nation, the economic bubble was about to bust. Yes, there was economic prosperity in some aspects of the nation. However, consumer debt was too large, and the stock market was about to tumble. For the next lecture, I'll talk about the Great Depression and the government's response, the New Deal. Well, take care, have a great day, and the next few slides will show sources for this lecture as well as hyperlinks to additional information.